In this era of gaming, we're used to any controversy immediately being patched out in games, such as verses from the Quran being removed from Little Big Planet, and ukulele's removal of everyone's favourite video gamer, Darkside Phil. Thank you, you fucking worthless humans, for the views! However, earlier games didn't have such a luxury. Whenever a controversial topic, or worse, a legal threat was brought forward, they not only had to recall all copies on sale, but also literally destroy them. So this episode, we take a look at these shattered software, these consumed console games, and these annihilated applications. Their physical presence may be gone, but unfortunately, you can never patch out or destroy their lies. But hello you, I'm Guru Larry, and I'll welcome you to Fact Hunt. Five games recalled, then destroyed. I'll put a couple of extra exclamation marks in there to make it extra clickbaity. Yeah. When Sega released Castle of Illusion back in 1990, it was a clear sign that the Sega Mega Drive had tons of potential. Here was a really bloody good 16-bit platformer, something that you definitely couldn't do on the NES, featuring a much-loved cartoon character. It was a hit, and naturally, people wanted more. Unfortunately, Sega ended up giving them Fantasia instead. Thanks to the skills of Infograms, who Sega had outsourced the game to, Fantasia plays like a botched version of Sega's earlier classic, complete with controls that don't work, nearly unplayable nonsensical levels, and comical recreations of the film's classical music. Yes, this was based off the 1940 film, you know, one of Disney's most loved creations, and probably Mickey Mouse's most famous outing. So, no biggie then. Now, Disney are infamously protective of their IPs, especially back then. Licensing them out for a game was often insanely expensive due to the controls they put on them. But Sega's Fantasia apparently slipped through the net to the point that they didn't even realise that Sega even had the licence for it. When they saw the rushed botch job that Sega had released, Disney were furious and demanded that the game be pulled from shelves. And while Sega did make other decent Disney-based games such as Quackshot and World of Illusion, it is believed that the woeful job that Sega did with Fantasia was the catalyst for Disney deciding to go into game development for themselves. A decision that ultimately gave us Aladdin. So, all's well that ends well. Yeah! Uni Rally, or Uni Racers if you're American, was a Super Nintendo game made by DMA Design then famous for little people falling off ledges, and later famous for little people running over Harry Krishnas in cars. You might wonder what it's doing here. Well, naturally, you're going to find out. The main aim of the game was to show everyone that actually, the Super Nintendo could do games that were just as fast as Sonic the Hedgehog, and it didn't need any blast processing either. It's a fast racing game where you control an unmanned unicycle around some very confusing tracks, trying to get as much speed as you can. Some liked it at the time, others didn't. But it's got a pretty okay reputation now. However, it might have had more if it was able to stay on the shelves. Uni Rally ended up falling foul of Pixar Studios, who sued DMA and claimed that the design and concept of the unmanned unicycle was copied from their 1987 short film, Red Stream. The two bikes do look somewhat similar, it has to be said. Still, it's just a unicycle, so there's not really that much design variation. And Mike Daly was quoted as saying that Pixar clearly thought that any computer-generated unicycle was their property. In any case, DMA still lost the suit, and Nintendo were unable to make or sell any more copies of the game. Any unsold ones would have to be destroyed, and the game never sold beyond its initial run of 300,000 copies. A bit of a shame, really, considering that the game's half decent. But that's what happens when you annoy a rich animation studio. Come on, you knew this was going to be on the list, didn't you? I mean, if it wasn't, you'd undoubtedly have written a comment complaining about it. 
Atari's licensed game based around Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial was supposed to be the biggest hit game of 1982, but turned out to be a disaster. So why did it all go wrong? Well, first off, the idea to actually develop a game based off of E.T. wasn't formed before the movie. It actually happened after the film was released in cinemas and became a success. Secondly, it wasn't even Atari's idea. It actually came from Steve Ross, the CEO of Atari's parent company, Warner Communications. Atari CEO Ray Kazar went on record to say that making a game based off E.T. was a dumb idea. And he turned out to be right. Thirdly, because of both of these things, but in particular the need to get E.T. out as quickly as possible before the film had left theatres completely and people started to forget about it, designer Howard Scott Warshaw, who previously made the more successful Raiders of the Lost Ark game, had just five and a half weeks design and program E.T. entirely by himself. The result is a game where you can almost see what he was trying to do, but it's far too rushed and, in the end, was just, well, broken. There just wasn't enough time to make a good game here. The E.T. game was panned by fans and critics alike, eventually going down, perhaps unfairly given the circumstances, as one of the worst games ever made. But why was it destroyed? Atari had made 5 million copies of E.T. and expected to sell them all, but in the end they only sold 1.5 million, and of those 1.5 million, a significant amount of which were returned. After a terrible year in 1983, Atari took a whole bunch of their unsold and returned inventory, mostly E.T. and Pac-Man carts, and buried them in the Alamogordo Desert, covering them up with concrete just to be sure they weren't rediscovered, much to the distress of the locals who made sure that such a thing would never happen again. Although the event was well documented at the time, most people still thought that it was an urban legend until 2013, when the site was excavated and some copies of the game were actually found. And then the AVGN made a film all about it. So there's not much good to be said about this whole thing, really. Here's another game that had to be here, really. Good old stadium events. It's funny though, if you're in Europe, then you might wonder what just all the fuss is all about, because Stadium Events was released over here normally, just like any other title. I mean, it's not even that rare. The North American version, however, well, that's a whole different story. The game itself, made by Bandai, isn't a particularly memorable affair. It consists of four different Olympic events, the 100 meters, the 110 meter hurdles, the long jump, and the triple jump. The gimmick is that you play these events using a family fitness mat that you put on the floor using your feet to hit the buttons a la Dance Dance Revolution. This proved popular in Japan where it originally came out, along with a whole other line of mat based titles known as the Family Trainer Games. Eventually it was decided to bring the fitness mat to America. In 1988 however, Nintendo liked it so much that they wanted it for themselves, and so they bought it off Bandai and released it as the power pad. Stadium events would go along with it, but it was quickly decided that the game should be rebranded as World Class Track Meet, and released with the pad in order to make it a first party game just after production began. Nintendo ended up producing 10,000 copies of stadium events before the change was made, 200 were sold in stores, and most of the rest were destroyed. So, because of this, a North American copy of Stadium Events is very rare indeed. Probably the rarest officially released NES game. In fact, they usually sell for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on eBay. Funnily enough, Howard Phillips, Nintendo's bow-tied former spokesman, doesn't believe they were all destroyed. But if not, then why are they so rare? Maybe there's a warehouse out there full of them, waiting to be found. It is a mystery. Yes, Tetris. There's really no other choice for the number one slot here. Of course this entry doesn't concern any official version of the game, it has to do with the Tengen version of the title, and indeed any version of Tetris back in 1989 that wasn't Nintendo's. 
The game itself doesn't exactly need much of an introduction here, I mean, being the most famous computer game puzzle game ever created and all. But the story of Tetris' rights is a real doozy. After the game was originally made in 1988 by Soviet programmer Alexei Paginov, it quickly spread like wildfire across Eastern Europe, eventually attracting the attention of people from the West. One of them, Robert Stein from Andromeda, went to the USSR to negotiate the rights. No mean feat seeing as the game was basically government property. Still, he claimed that he succeeded and worked with Mirosoft, or Spectrum Holobyte if you're American, on the home computer version of Tetris. He also negotiated a deal with Atari Tengen for, supposedly, the arcade and console rights of the game. It was at this point that the Soviets intervened, disputing Stein's claim. You see, Stein thought that he had the rights to license out all versions of Tetris, but it seems he only had rights to the computer version. At the same time as this was all going on, Hank Rogers, working on behalf of Nintendo, was also in negotiations for handheld and console rights, ultimately having a big meeting featuring him, Kevin Maxwell, Mirosoft, and Andromeda's representative, and the Soviet authorities, eventually. He came out with the rights to the handheld and console versions of the game, Apparently this happened even though no less a figure than Robert Maxwell himself, the tycoon owner of Mirosoft, called Mikhail Gorbachev himself in order to intervene and secure the rights. But still, Tengens thought they still had the rights to the game. Already no fans of Nintendo thanks to an antitrust suit, meaning that all games they released on the system were unlicensed. They released a version of Tetris for the NES in May of 1989, suing Nintendo into the bargain, who naturally countersued. Again, the Soviets intervened and confirmed that Tengen only had the rights to the arcade version of Tetris, ending the dispute in Nintendo's favour and confirming that they were the console rights holder. And so, Tengen's NES game was only out for a month before it had to be recalled and destroyed. Funnily enough though, some consider it to be at least better than Nintendo's NES version. The final decision also doomed a Sega port of their Japanese arcade Tetris to the Mega Drive, making that one of the rarest games on the system, and adding even more strings to this knot. It's quite the story. And what of Alexei Paginov, the man who made the game? How much money did he make thanks to all of this? Not a single sodding ruble. Well, at least not until long after the wall came down, anyway. Hello you. Thanks ever so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified. And be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now.